Um, well, then I would like to begin by welcoming everyone today to the EuroCC Semer seminar series uh, that is organized by the Computation Based Science and Technology Research Center here at the Cyprus Institute. Today, we are very honored to have Professor Zoe Gurnia with us from the Academy of Athens. Uh, she has quite an outstanding CV, um, but I will just mention a few points. Um, Professor Gurnia graduated from the chemistry department at the University of Athens following which she completed her PhD at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, she worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the chemistry department uh, in Yale University, um, and her work was on the computer-aided drug design, uh, and this was followed by a lectureship at Yale College. Uh, currently, Dr. G um, Gun oh, professor, rather, sorry, uh, Gunnar no, is a doctor, I'm not a professor. <laughs> okay, um, is a researcher at the Biomedical Research Foundation um, at the Academy of Athens, uh, where she works on anti-cancer drug and materials design using high performance computing. Uh, and today she will said, uh, shed some light uh, on her research in a presentation on multi-scale modeling of biomolecules and materials. Um, thank you very, very much for, for joining us today and for your time, and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to present my work here at the joint EuroCC and CMA online seminar series at Castor C. It's a great pleasure. I've uh, visited uh, you in the past and I have very good relations. Uh, and it's great to be co-hosted uh, by the Competence Center as well as uh, the CMA. Um, so let me start by saying that uh, modeling has been a major contributor to science in the past 50 years, but even more so in the last decade when the advent of supercomputing is driving science through simulations in many, many areas of uh, physics, such as weather and environment, design of new materials, as well as in energy, but also in biology and medicine, empowering uh, finding new cures. Uh, and really in the futures, new materials and systems will be characterized by progressively higher uh, degrees of complexity uh, due to the strong relationship between nanotechnology, biotechnology, cognitive disciplines, computer science, and computing power. So in my lab, we focus mainly on biomolecular materials design with a special focus on uh, nanomaterials and their interaction with the cell membrane using multi-scale modeling. Also cell membrane dynamics, protein dynamics and protein membrane interactions are a focal point because 50% of pharmacological targets are membrane associated proteins. And these interactions are crucial. Uh, so we perform these studies using a combination of modeling, biophysics techniques, as well as machine learning. And we utilize this critical information in order to identify new small molecules that can act as lead compounds, as candidate drugs, for and optimizing them subsequently with physics-based methods. So in molecular simulations, we have uh, different scales where processes take place. And the methods and accuracy of uh, uh, these methods range from quantum chemistry up uh, to the continuum. The accurate property prediction for complex nanostructure materials and biomolecules remains a critical issue in their design strategy. As with quantum mechanics, we're still limited to the angstrom length scale and the femtosecond, picosecond time scales. Um, further on, we have domestic simulations based on molecular dynamics on Monte Carlo methods. Uh, um, they allow um, uh, structure uh, property relationships to be derived already for, system, for systems of noticeable size and time scales. For example, in uh, the micrometer and microsecond uh, length and time scales. And indeed, the advancement of high performance computing has already expanded these time uh, and length scales. Uh, and the upcoming exascale uh, and the advent, perhaps soon, of the quantum based computers will further contribute to this expansion. Um, however, the investigation of many critical phenomena remain inaccessible for uh, atomistic based simulations. So in this talk, uh, I will apply multi-scale simulation techniques to structurally based uh, physical chemical models and integrate along um, temporal and spatial scales, thereby improving our understanding of these uh, phenomena. 
So I'll be discussing atomistic molecular models, enhanced sampling techniques, coarse grain models, machine learning, and if we have time, uh, and it's not too much, a mark of state models as well. Um, so atomistic molecular models aim to uh, bridge the understanding between the structure of uh, a molecule, a material, a biomolecule, and the function of uh, this entity through its dynamics. So a particular technique in this area, it's called uh, molecular dynamic simulations, and it can help us gain a molecular atomic level picture of structure and dynamics, enable property predictions such as ion transport, solvent effects, and others. So uh, let's see here an overview of molecular dynamic simulations. It's a, a computational method with, which describes equilibrium and dynamics properties of a molecular system. And we do that by generating configurations of the system by integrating Newton's law of motion and calculating the time dependence of the molecular system. So we generate uh, microscopic uh, so information at the microscopic level, such as atomic positions and velocities, and we connect this microscopic information to macroscopic properties through statistical mechanics. Thereby, we can connect structure and function by providing additional information to experimental techniques through the system dynamics. So here you can see how with molecular dynamic simulations, we can input in one uh, simulation box water, which is in white, and phospholipids. And spontaneously, the system folds into a lipid bilayer, which is the a biological entity of a cell membrane. So now the question is really how can we build a model that can simulate molecular motions and properties in the microsecond time scale and micrometer length scale. So the first consideration is the interactions that occur in this time and length scales in molecular level, which we can call um, intermolecular interactions. So interactions that are inside a molecule, uh, for example, a protein inside a protein, we call them bonded and non-bonded interactions. And interactions between molecules, um, the non-bonded interactions, which can be hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interactions, Van der Waals interactions, and pi pi interactions. So all the quantities that we need to calculate, they're connected directly or indirectly with Hamiltonian of the system, the energy and its derivatives. Therefore, how can I model the energy of the system in a, in a way that describes the basic characteristics of the behavior of the system? And how can I achieve this uh, with a computational efficient way? In reality, intermolecular interactions are very complex interactions to model, but we can use approximations to model them in an efficient way. And uh, in particular, uh, here in the Hamiltonian, we have the kinetic energy and the potential energy and of course, the kinetic energy is, is, is simple, we all know it, but the potential energy, we have to derive an energy function or force field as we call it, to describe the bonded and non-bonded interactions that can occur in a material or in a biomolecule. Uh, let's see how we, can, how we can construct this potential energy. So molecules undergo vibrational motion. This is the first consideration you can see it here, uh, which we can model as a harmonic potential according to Hooke's law. Equilibrium bond lengths are known from experiments or from quantum mechanics calculations. Uh, and um, uh, also you, we know that uh, in this harmonic approximation of uh, the bond uh, vibration, uh, which we can treat as a spring, uh, it's not really correct because uh, this is a harmonic potential while this is the actual potential of uh, a bond because if you stretch it uh, enough, the bond will break, uh, which is in contrast to the harmonic potential. But we do uh, use the harmonic approximation because other potentials that we can describe the bond stretching, for example, the Morse term, um, are generally not used in molecular dynamic simulations because here we have three parameters instead of two, plus this function, which is the harmonic potential, is much easier to simulate uh, in a computer. Another consideration is uh, the vibration of an angle. So here I'm showing uh, an amino acid, which is vibrating. Uh, and uh, here again, we can take the harmonic approximation to simulate the vibration of an angle. So as if we had a spring here. Uh, then we have uh, 
motions of rotation, such as here, uh, this group is rotating. And of course, it's a periodic motion. So simply, we can model it with a cosine function. Uh, then we can move on to non-bonded interactions, so entailing atoms that are not bonded to each other by covalent bonds. And this can be, for example, static interactions. So how can we model this with a simple function? We already know that two charges are interacting with Coulomb's law. So we can introduce uh, the Coulomb's law in our potential energy function. Further, we know that atoms uh, that are non-bonded interact through Van der Waals. Uh, interactions and the Van der Waals potentials can be modeled by a function which is called uh, Leonard Jones, um, having a repulsive and an attractive term here. Finally, we can bring in all these properties together so the bending potential, the bonding angle, the improper torsions, the torsions, the Leonard Jones, and the Coulomb in order to build the Hamiltonian of the system, the kinetic energy, and the potential energy. And as we said, the potential energy will consist of all these terms the bond stretching, the angle st uh, bending, the, the rotation of the dihedrals, uh, and also uh, the Van der Waals interactions and the electrostatic interactions. So before now that we have built this uh, energy potential energy function, before starting a simulation, uh, we actually have to do an energy minimization. It's, a, it's advisable to do this because it can correct flaws such as steric clashes between atoms and distorted bonds, uh, angles, or lengths. So the goal is to, of the energy minimization is then to find uh, the local energy minimum to start an MD uh, simulation from a realistic structure or to perform normal mode analysis to analyze the system vibrations. Uh, and an application of uh, the energy minimization, as I mentioned, is uh, the normal mode analysis. So the vibrations of a molecules are given uh, by its normal modes and its absorption in a vibrational spectrum corresponds to a normal mode. So these are characteristic vibrations of the system. Um, that we see here, for example, the water normal modes, they have uh, specific um, modes, frequencies that they are vibrating as well as uh, vectors uh, towards which they are uh, vibrating. These are quite important, the normal modes, because they are, uh, they are motions that occur even at absolute zero. So these are the modes of the, our molecule that will vibrate uh, inherently. So even with no energy, the system will, will possess these vibrations. Uh, and here we can see how we can derive the normal modes of the system if we consider a system of coupled oscillators connected with springs. And we solve a system of differential equations, resulting in the end in eigenvectors and eigenvalues, which are the frequencies and the vectors of uh, the motion. But let's see an example of how all this theoretical background that I just described can be um, used in examining and investigating, for example, a cell membrane, a biological entity. So the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, uh, is um, uh, an entity that encloses the cell. It protects the cell from the surroundings, and it's a selectively permeable barrier. So all our cells have a cell membrane. It's really crucial uh, to cellular processes such as cell adhesion and signaling. Um, in order to model a cell membrane, we don't model all this chemical uh, uh, complex entity which has proteins uh, and different uh, uh, glycosylated lipids and so on, but we rather go into model membranes, which, however, uh, have a big uh, connection to the realistic representation. A major entity of the bilayers is the, is the phospholipid molecule, so the polar head group and the hydrophobic lipid tail that you can see here, but also cholesterol, which is about 40% molar in the plasma membrane. And this is a really important molecule for uh, our membranes because it can regulate membrane fluidity, permeability, and the lateral mobility of proteins. And actually, you can see here our own cholesterol in contrast with lanosterol, which is the plant-based sterol, and you see that the molecules are almost identical, just very, very small uh, differences in their chemical structures. For example, here, this methyl group, there's a, a double bond here. However, uh, 
cholesterol, in order to be converted to cholesterol in our body, it requires 18 enzymatic steps. And really the question is, why did nature spend so much energy in order to convert this lanosterol molecule to cholesterol in our body, uh, which has very tiny differences? I mean, the differences are almost uh, neg neglectable. Um, so the reason why the sterols are important uh, in, uh, in our cell membranes is because they have a very special uh, characteristics. Uh, so they abolish the lipid phase transition of membranes. What does this mean? So uh, membranes, lipids, they have a phase transition. Imagine butter in the fridge. It is a solid or gel-like. And in, outside of the fridge, when you put it in the pan, it becomes a liquid. So that means that there's a phase transition. When you incorporate sterols in the lipid membrane, this phase transition is abolished. And another phase is formed, which is called the liquid ordered phase. Uh, and actually, if we didn't have cholesterol in, in our membranes, we would be all in the liquid phase uh, based on the melting temperatures uh, that uh, the cell membrane composition has. So how can we model the sterols uh, with molecular simulations? So the first thing to do is to determine how the force field, the potential energy function will look like in order to do molecular dynamic simulations. So the first step is to determine force constants for the potential energy function. And as I mentioned before, explained that uh, the potential energy function contains bond and interactions, such as the bond stretching, the angle stretching, the dihedral rotation, and uh, the out-of-plane motions. And um, these equilibrium lengths are known from experimental uh, uh, experiments, from equilibrium um, distances or from quantum calculations. Um, but these force constants uh, coming from uh, Hooke's law are unknown because, of course, they're not experimentally observable. So this, this is just a model. Uh, so uh, we could get these uh, constants from experimental uh, uh, data, for example, from vibrational frequencies um, or from ab initio results. Uh, and these are connected, these force constants, if you see here, the formula are connected to the second derivative of the energy with respect to the coordinates. So you can build a force constant matrix, which is called the Hessian at the energy minimum. So we can use normal mode analysis in order to approximate a complex energy landscape by harmonic potential and to calculate uh, the force constant matrix, the Hessian at the energy minimum. To do this, uh, we will derive the vibrational energies, the vibrational frequencies, which are the energy of the vibration, as well as the eigenvectors, which are the correspond to the internal motions. In order to derive these force constants, we will do quantum mechanics uh, calculations uh, using uh, software. Uh, and then we will fit our molecular mechanical potential in order to reproduce the vibrational frequencies uh, and again, vectors from quantum mechanics. And to do this, um, we built an algorithm, which is called the automated frequency matrix, uh, matching method, uh, where we use normal mode analysis uh, to match frequencies and eigenvectors. So the first thing to do is to calculate uh, the quantum mechanical um, and normal modes, and then to project the molecular mechanics normal modes, uh, so the eigenvectors onto the reference quantum mechanics again vectors. So if we take the dot product uh, of uh, the, the projection here, uh, the two eigenvectors, we know that if we're talking about the same eigenvector, we're going to have uh, the delta of Kronecker uh, equal to one. Uh, and if uh, we uh, have a different eigenvector, we are going to have zero because uh, the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Uh, so in this uh, respect, we can minimize a merit function uh, where uh, we hope that this can become zero in the ideal case. So this is the quantum mechanical uh, frequency uh, minus the frequency corresponding to the maximum projection uh, between the reference quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics eigenvectors. 
Uh, so iteratively, we can do this, and I have uh, a workflow here, which will make it much easier to understand, because I know that the concept might sound a little difficult. Uh, so we start with uh, force constants, so the parameters of the uh, potential energy function. Uh, we run normal mode analysis in uh, molecular mechanics calculations. We input quantum mechanics normal modes here, mm -hmm. and then we project the eigenvectors from molecular mechanics onto quantum mechanics. And obviously, we expect for the best projection possible, uh, which is not going to be very good in the beginning. Uh, that's why we calculate this merit function uh, from uh, comparing the quantum mechanical frequency minus the frequency corresponding uh, to the uh, maximum uh, projection. And uh, the, at the first time, we, nothing happens. So we just go and change the parameters. So now we have a second set of parameters. We run again normal modes in molecular mechanics. We compare, uh, we project the molecular mechanics with uh, quantum mechanics and normal modes results. We calculate the merit function. And if now it's uh, minimized, so it's less the value of the new parameters produce a y square that is less, meaning that the quantum mechanical frequency is closer to the frequency that corresponds to the maximum projection, then we keep the parameters because it means that they are better because we have minimized their function. Now we go back and we do this um, iteratively uh, thousands of times uh, until we reach 6,000 steps where uh, no matter how much we change the parameters, uh, the y squared won't change. Uh, and that uh, reaches us to, for example, for the cholesterol molecule, to a matching between quantum mechanical uh, frequencies and molecular mechanical frequencies. Uh, uh, to a deviation of uh, 40 wave numbers, which is, uh, which is overall a good agreement. And then we have non-harmonic terms that we can fit, such as the uh, rotations of uh, here, for example, this hydroxyl, so the rotational barriers are an harmonic term. Uh, and what we can do is, again, to model uh, this system with quantum mechanics calculations uh, and find the rotational barrier and then match uh, the charm, uh, which is a molecular mechanics potential of this equation in order to reproduce this curve. So we can just fit the parameters in order to match the quantum mechanics parameters. Of course, we have to, as you remember, we have to apply the Coulomb's law. So we have to calculate the point charges. And the point charges are not experiment, are, they are not experimentally observables. So we have to calculate them uh, through a fitting procedure. We calculate the quantum mechanical electrostatic potential, and then we find the set of point charges that are best matched to the classical potential. Uh, we can do this like that. And then the van der Waals parameters, uh, they are also uh, calculated initially by the QM, finding the curve, and then matching the Leonard Jones potential parameters uh, uh, by calculating this curve iteratively until uh, the molecular mechanics potential matches the quantum mechanics potentials. We can validate uh, this whole process in uh, crystal simulations. For example, here we took the cholesterol crystal and uh, performed the molecular uh, mechanics calculation, uh, molecular dynamics calculation in order to calculate uh, how much uh, there is a deviation of uh, the cell uh, dimensions from the experiment compared to molecular dynamics. And we had very good agreement, which means that the parameters are stable and the crystal can be simulated. So now we have parameters for cholesterol. So now we can go on in our model membrane containing phospholipids and cholesterol, as well as water that you see here in red. And here is the model membrane. So we can calculate the properties of cholesterol versus ergosterol, which is a fungal sterol, and lanosterol, which is found in plants. And the uh, question is, how, why are the physicochemical um, properties of the membranes different uh, because they have so much, um, they're so much chemically similar. Why they have differences in physical chemical properties? And also another question is whether we can predict these phase transitions. Um, so for uh, molecular dynamic simulations, 
um, we calculate, um, uh, we have several approximations that we have to use. Uh, and um, for example, the born oppenheimer approximation is uh, the approximation that tells us that the nuclei uh, move really uh, much less than uh, the electrons of the system. Uh, and, excuse me, uh, and also, uh, as a consequence, they can be treated separately. Uh, the second uh, approximation uh, treats the nuclei as point particles that follow uh, classical Newtonian dynamics. And in a classical molecular dynamics, the effects of the electrons is approximated as a single potential energy surface, usually uh, representing uh, the ground state. We've already discussed uh, the approximations in the potential energy function. Uh, and we will take a coordinates from experimental structures and velocities uh, from a distribution. So in molecular simulation, we will calculate the microscopic uh, descriptions of coordinates and velocities uh, using statistical mechanics. And uh, we will derive uh, micro macroscopic properties from microscopic picture using the Newton's equation of motion, uh, which when we equate it to the gradient of the potential energy, then we get a differential equation, which we need to solve. Uh, and uh, that leads us to the molecular simulation, having a microscopic description, which, however, we have to connect to the macroscopic description uh, with experiment. Uh, and that's based on a theory, which is called statistical mechanics, uh, based on the principle uh, that the population in the energy of states uh, follow uh, the Boltzmann distribution, which we will see next. So we know here, we assume that the distribution of the particles are following uh, the Boltzmann law. And uh, we know that the distribution for the lowest energy state. So we can derive based on the lowest energy state distribution, a molecular partition function that determines how particles distribute themselves over accessible states that they have in thermal equilibrium conditions. Uh, so then we can uh, calculate uh, the partition function per particle for quantum uh, statistical mechanics, which have discrete eigenstates. And in classical statistical mechanics, the position and momenta um, of a particle can vary continuously. Excuse me. So we have integrals uh, rather than uh, sum. When we calculate the, the molecular partition function, uh, then we can deduct properties for uh, virtually anything, any property of the system. Uh, for example, uh, the entropy, which you can see here. Um, so another property from uh, the MD simulations that we have to discuss is how we can calculate averages for the macroscopic uh, picture. Uh, for example, uh, we know that we have a limited simulation time, so we're calculating uh, the uh, expected value of the ensemble. Uh, but we have, in the ergodic hypothesis, we have to make the assumption that the expected value of the ensemble will be the expected value uh, in time for a system in thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, so here is a workflow for running a molecular dynamic simulations. We take experimental coordinates and velocities from a distribution. We minimize uh, the uh, energy of the structure. Then we do system equilibration to the desired temperature and pressure. Uh, and we proceed with production dynamics, analysis of results. And then, as mentioned, we can connect the microscopic trajectory to microscopic observables. So let's apply all this now to the molecular simu dynamic simulations of the lipid phases. So <clears throat> as mentioned, we have three sterols, ergosterol, cholesterol, and ranosterol, which we studied. Unfortunately, there's no time to go in, uh, in detail through all the results because I want to show you uh, a lot of uh, systems here. Uh, but let me summarize the results of this work <clears throat> by saying that the different sterols have different effects on the membrane, on the physical chemical properties of the membrane. We studied that by uh, calculating electron density profiles, and we found that all sterols increase the membrane thickness, so they make uh, the membrane uh, larger. So th this is the thickness of the membrane. And actually, ergosterol makes the thickest membrane, selenosterol the thinner. Cholesterol is in the middle. We calculated uh, the tilt angle with respect to uh, the, uh, this z-axis here. Again, cholesterol is in the middle. 
the order parameter, which tells us how ordered these lipids are, uh, then uh, we find that, uh, again, cholesterol has an intermediate behavior. Ranosterol makes the most disordered membranes. We can calculate it at the trans cause fraction of these methyl rotations. Uh, and we find that the sterols inhibit the rotation of the middle uh, carbons compared to the lipid phase. Uh, we can also calculate the area per lipid. So we find that sterols induce condensation effect. Again, cholesterol is found in the middle. Uh, for solvation, we're using radial distribution function. We find that cholesterol is the most solvated sterol. And finally, although always cholesterol was in, in the middle of the structural properties, for the diffusion derived from molecular dynamics and quasi elastic neutron scattering calculations, we find that cholesterol has the fastest diffusion among all sterols. So here are some examples of what I was describing. And um, for example, here we measure the order parameter uh, based on the second Lazand polynomial. And we find uh, that uh, cholesterol, ergosterol, which is in green, has the most order. So 0 0.5 is absolute order with a z-axis. So if this is 90 degrees, this becomes 0 0.5. So ergosterol has the best order. Then cholesterol in black and lanosterol in red. The same trend is found uh, exactly the same with NMR experiments. We can also measure orientational uh, uh, correlation functions, uh, which uh, can tell us uh, how the rearrangements are happening. So how uh, the rotation of uh, the lipids are happening inside uh, the bilayer. Uh, we calculate, uh, we can calculate the radial distribution functions which reveal the solvation. So uh, here uh, we have cholesterol in black, which has the most solvation. Um, the time correlation functions, which tells us how the molecules are diffusing based on the mean squared, on their mean squared displacement. Again, cholesterol uh, here in the XY plane the hydrogens uh, are the fastest, uh, but if you go here uh, in the z-axis, uh, cholesterol has the fastest. Uh, and this correlates well with quasi-elastic and neutron scattering calculations. Um, so uh, cholesterol retains a large amount of flexibility in the membrane, as we found, while at the same time orders the membrane. And it, it looks like cholesterol has the ideal chemical structure uh, for retaining both the flexibility as well as the order in mammalian plasma membranes to achieve complex fu functions, for example, found in lipid rafts. So ergosterol makes very stiff membranes while anosterol disorders the membrane. Cholesterol is somewhere in the middle retaining the order, but at the same time, it's very fast so it can enable complex uh, membrane function. So moving on uh, to the second part of the talk, uh, here we will discuss how we can achieve longer time and length scales uh, compared to atomistic simulations. So for example, we were modeling the, uh, the DPPC lipids with 130 atoms using all atom simulations. However, we, we are limited into a few nanometers and a few uh, nanoseconds of simulations. But what if we would coarse grain these atoms? We could coarse grain them into beads or particles of uh, um, interactions that are effective interactions, effective particles that would uh, uh, entail more atoms inside the bead. So from 130 atoms, we could actually end up with 20, 12 particles. And with this, uh, we would reduce the uh, degrees of freedom. So it would allow us to perform uh, much uh, uh, faster calculations. And here, again, you can see uh, the self-assembly uh, of a cholesterol-containing membrane uh, with the water in white, with the lipids in blue and magenta, and cholesterol in yellow. So you see from a random distribution, that we can uh, observe the self assembly of such a system. Uh, we can also simulate using such a coarse-grained representation, uh, the uh, lipids 
uh, phase transition. So the gel phase, the liquid phase, and the liquid ordered phase. So with spontaneous self-assemblies. Uh, we can measure, again, the lipid NMR order parameters, again, using the second Lezant polynomial and actually um, uh, comparing it to experiments, to experimental uh, work. And we can uh, finally do a large scale coarse grain molecular dynamic studies of the cholesterol effect. Uh, here uh, we have uh, 2000 lipids, so a micrometer uh, length scale, microsecond time scale, and we can construct full phase diagrams of uh, DPPC cholesterol system. So this is the phase diagram as a function of temperature and cholesterol concentration, along with the condensation effect. Uh, so here uh, is cholesterol percentage. So we see that as we move towards uh, the uh, higher cholesterol concentration, we have in green the liquid ordered phase. So there is no uh, liquid phase transition happening here. Of course, it happens below a certain information because if we freeze us, we will freeze anyway. And uh, in these lines, you can see the experimental data from Winston Davis from the 90s. And uh, so you see that our um, uh, phase diagram, the computational phase diagram, fits very well the experimental uh, data. Uh, and uh, then we proceeded to investigate a ternary system, which mimics the lipid uh, structure, the lipid matrix of the stratum corneum, which is the outermost layer of the epidermis. So our system here consists of uh, ceramide, cholesterol, and lignoceric acid uh, at 23 different temperatures, uh, sorry, composition ratios and two different temperatures using coarse grain simulations. Uh, so here again, we can simulate the phase transition of a ternary uh, lipid uh, uh, phase. And that's uh, pretty complex because as we go higher in complexity of lipid molecules, the mixing becomes very time consuming and we have really to employ uh, uh, supercomputers as well as these coarse grain models that I uh, mentioned. So we see here that in, in 340 kelvins, we have a liquid, mostly a liquid disordered phase up to 50% uh, cholesterol or above the 50% cholesterol uh, and, uh, sorry, below, it's here. Uh, and here uh, the gel phase is dominating. Uh, and going uh, further from these pure membranes that we basically investigated more to understand whether we could really model simple systems uh, and then proceed to more complex system, for example, to investigate nanoparticle membrane interactions for a hash drug delivery. Uh, we proceeded with uh, some nanoparticle applications and nanoparticles have become uh, very popular in medicine, uh, especially with the first uh, FDA approval of, uh, FD, uh, of uh, Abraxan, which is called here, which is shown here. Uh, this delivers Paclitaxel to breast cancer uh, tumors. So we wanted to understand uh, how uh, the nanoparticles can interact with cell membranes and how they can affect their properties. So we investigated a system that was studied in the literature experimentally. Uh, this is a nanoparticle uh, which has a gold core and with a 4.3 nanometer diameter and it's coated with uh, a charged ligand, a negatively charged ligand, uh, as well as with hydrophobic ligand. Uh, first, we investigated the nanoparticles inside a uh, bilayer, and we found that the charged uh, ligands want to uh, interact with the charged lipid head groups, but the hydrophobic ligands, they are staying in, in the membrane. Uh, so we observe such uh, an effect called the snorkeling effect, and no spontaneous insertion was really um, uh, observed. Um, so when the nanoparticle is already inside the membrane, uh, we can see already that the nanoparticle has a tendency to exit. So if it has a carrier, it could actually deliver it inside the cell. And most interestingly, we found that the nanoparticle induces a local phase transition. Uh, so here uh, we can see uh, that around the nanoparticle, 
we have uh, a liquid or a liquid disordered phase, which is in green, uh, which is induced by the nanoparticle. So the nanoparticle pushes away the cholesterol. Uh, and in order to understand how the nanoparticle uh, enters and exits, we couldn't see it spontaneously. So we had to apply free energy calculations. So these are enhanced sampling simulations to cross barriers. And that's why we call it multi-scale modeling because we can uh, use artificial potentials in order to improve the sampling where ECODIST is hindered by the form of the system's energy landscape and uh, overcome barriers using these artificial potentials. Uh, so we found that with the presence of cholesterol, it is really uh, much more difficult for uh, the cholesterol, for the nanoparticle to cross the membrane barrier. Uh, you see here uh, that uh, the barrier is uh, um, maybe two, two times bigger when in comparison to when there's no cholesterol. Uh, so we found that probably that's why uh, the, there's a local cholesterol dep depletion around the nanoparticle, probably the, because uh, cholesterol is hindering uh, the penetration of the nanoparticle and the system wants to expel it. Then we went on into studying uh, a nanoparticle, nanoparticle dimer formations in the model membrane. And we started with two nanoparticles, which we saw they would associate after 12 microseconds, and they would actually form a water pore where ions would flow in between. So this is a side view, and this is uh, uh, another side view. And we found, found that they form when they associate a toroidal-like uh, pore formation. And then we moved on a, a nanoparticle, four nanoparticle system, a tetramer association, which again was accompanied by local cholesterol depletion. So uh, the system is pushing cholesterol away, but also very interestingly, they form these uh, line structures, uh, which uh, we, all, we always found it to be a reproducible phenomenon. So we found that there was a high, significant hydrophobicity mismatch in the area of the nanoparticle tetramer. And uh, this hydrophobicity mismatch, uh, it made the nanoparticle to form these lines uh, and show a decrease in lipid ordering. Um, also, we found that uh, we thought that this uh, hydrophobic mismatch uh, mimics the protein assembly uh, mismatch where uh, the membrane inclusion self assembly to reduce areas of high surface tension caused by this hydrophobic mismatch. Uh, and these protein inclusions associate to reduce this net interfacial uh, energy, uh, which has been termed as the ordered phobic uh, effect uh, by Chandler in 2016. Um, so these ordered disordered interfaces, as we see here, they are minimized during this tetramer formation. However, proteins don't form lines, as we know. They form uh, structures such as uh, these tetramers. Uh, but when we try to place the nanoparticles in a tetramer formation, uh, they would never stay like that. So they would always disintegrate and try to form the chain. Uh, so we decided that uh, the major driver, driving force between uh, that governs nanoparticle self-assembly is not only the order phobic effect, but also the fact that uh, waters and ions stabilize nanoparticle, nanoparticle interactions, and that there is uh, an interplay between the two phenomena, so the snorkeling effect, uh, as well as the order phobic effect that makes these lines. So this is a balance between the forces that drive the nanoparticle association. Uh, so we published that in 2017. And actually, I showed this uh, in, a, in, a, in a workshop uh, after we had published it, around 2018. And the person that had done had given us the nanoparticles and had done the experiments, uh, they came back to us. And they said, oh my God, I cannot believe this because actually we see these lines forming with this particular nanoparticle that you have simulated and we see them forming as lines uh, on top of, of our nanoparticles using transmission electron microscopy. And these are uh, the structures and they were exactly the nanoparticles that we had uh, simulated, uh, which, did not happen when they used a different 
uh, radius of the nanoparticle with five nanometers. When you have five nanometers with uh, TEM's uh, spectroscopy, you do not see uh, these lines forming, which was a great confirmation of uh, our computational result coming after the fact. So it was a prospective calculation. Um, and then we wanted uh, to go even a step further uh, with the advancement of computational power. We wanted to actually see uh, if we can go back to the atomistic picture and go to bigger systems uh, using atomistic models, uh, more accurate atomistic models. Uh, so, because at the time the computing power uh, had was already advancing. So we wanted to model functionalized magnetic nanoparticles uh, and study the interaction with the cell membrane in a molecular level because uh, these nanoparticles are very efficient in being guided through magnetic fields in the body and reaching, for example, tumors uh, that um, uh, have to be targeted with drugs. Uh, one problem that we found was that we could actually uh, not create very easily uh, the nanoparticles because uh, from the crystallographic unit cell that is deposited in crystallographic databases, uh, it was not really easy to construct the equilibrium shape of a nanoparticle. And what do I mean here is that nanoparticles are formed by crystals of materials such as the magnetite. Uh, but in these individual crystals, they grow based on crystal habits, which give the characteristic external shape of a crystal. So when you have the magnetite unit cell, the unit cell will not grow into the face center cubic, but it will uh, create a different crystal shape based on Miller planes that have favorable energy. So a crystal will arrange itself such as its surface energy, so the Gibbs free energy, is minimized by assuming a shape of low surface energy. And the equilibrium shape of the crystal will be that which minimizes the value of this energy. And that's called the crystal habit. So given uh, a crystal uh, in the 111, uh, these uh, crystal habits will then proceed into favoring specific uh, Miller planes. Uh, where the 001 in magnetite, for example, it dominates the morphology, followed by the 111 surface truncating the corners of the tube, forming a cuboctahedron in real nature. So with two students, Kostadina Karathan and Alex Hadzigoulas, uh, we created uh, a program that calculates the crystal habit uh, based on the C file and the planes dominating the morphology. This is the workflow of our toolbox for creating the Wolf morphology or the crystal habit. This, it's the same. So from a C file and the Miller indices uh, with the energies and the maximum radius of the molecule, we can calculate the asymmetric unit, the space group, the point group as inputs. We take this as inputs. Uh, the symmetric Miller indices are calculated uh, from quantum mechanical calculations. And then we can take uh, the, both the symmetric unit cell replicated in as much as we want and the equilibrium shape from the symmetric Miller indices to calculate the final nanoparticle. And we have tested this against experimental results uh, and it's always working very well. Uh, so here's an overflow, so, so overview. So going from the crystal cell and the Wolf morphology, we can calculate the final nanoparticle. Okay, I can, I guess, we have built this in a web server so everybody can use it. You can upload uh, your C file, the crystal graphic file, choose the Miller indices and their corresponding minimum surface energies and the maximum radius of your nanoparticle. And then you will get the final coordinates cut in the shape of the crystal habit. Uh, further on, we use this toolbox in order to calculate, to simulate the magnetite coated uh, nanoparticle of polyvinyl alcohol and polyarabic acid. Uh, we did the molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, we, and then we calculated uh, the nanoparticle uh, in, contact, in contact with the cell membrane. Again, polyvinyl alcohol and polyarabic acid. And we found that uh, the magnetite coated with polyarabic acid preferentially interacts with the lipid bilayer compared to the polyvinyl alcohol, which is preferentially solvated in the water phase. 
uh, we conducted experiments, differential scanning calorimetry in collaboration with the School of Pharmacy, and in which, co um, which um, proved our experimental uh, calculation assumptions, uh, founding that there's strong interactions of magnetite polyarabic acid with the membrane, while no interactions of magnetite and polyvinyl alcohol were discovered. Uh, and going further, uh, these nanoparticles were then tested uh, with confocal microscopy inside uh, breast cancer cells, and they found that the magnetite nanoparticle can indeed enter the breast cancer cells, but the polyvinyl alcohol coated ma magnetite did not. So this was a confirmation of what we found that magnetite uh, coated with polyarabic will interact strongly with the lipid bilayer, but not the PVA. And they went even further uh, to use the magnetite uh, coated poly with polyarabic acid nanoparticle as a theranostic application. And you can see here that when polyarabic acid uh, coated magnetite, uh, sorry, when magnetite nanoparticles coated with polyarabic acid are loaded with doxorubicin, which is an anti cancer drug, uh, you have uh, uh, much um, uh, more tumor volume reduction. So the tumor is reduced. This is the tumor volume compared to the control, but also compared to doxorubicin at all. So this nanoparticle system is actually very efficient in delivering uh, doxorubicin. And finally, in the last five minutes that I have, I, I, I'm going to talk about uh, um, applications of machine learning in identifying protein membrane interfaces of peripheral membrane proteins using uh, machine learning. Uh, so uh, this is an application in the area of precision medicine. And precision medicine uh, is, uh, has to do with uh, drugs designed for specific proteins based on ind an indication of the disease. For example, in cancer, we can do a genotyping of our tumor uh, and then discover a prevalent mutation, which means that the mutation is causing the cancer, which means that we have carcinogenesis due to an oncogenic protein. And then we can proceed with drug design for a specific subset of patients that have this oncogenic protein. So this is called personalized medicine. Uh, so we can use this concept uh, to design small molecules that are targeting specific subset of patients with an oncogenic protein, a protein that's mutated. To inhibit the diseased proteins, we can use small molecules. Uh, you can see here three viral proteins, such as the HIV reverse transcriptase, uh, with a site here that can be inhibited by a small molecule, the influenza virus M2TM, uh, and the hepatitis uh, C, again inhibited, uh, sorry, the NS5B, again inhibited with a small molecule. Uh, so, uh, um, because the protein membrane binding is important in disease, as we know that 50% of drug targets are membrane associated proteins, uh, we want to understand how we can inhibit the location of proteins on the membrane with small molecules so that we can uh, inhibit this binding and have therapeutic interventions. But the brain membrane binding domain is usually not known. So a new algorithm must be devised to predict uh, these regions where the protein is binding on the membrane and later on, of course, to inhibit them with small molecules. But the first step is to understand how a protein is binding on the membrane. So we created um, a workflow starting from uh, calculating a protein conformational ensemble, so how the protein moves, identifying a membrane binding domain uh, region with an algorithm, calculating a binding site where the protein will attach on the membrane, and then seeing whether these uh, motions where we, you are attaching to the membrane are implicated with the active site of the protein, and finally performing drug design on this site. So here I, I will talk about the machine learning approach that we took for identifying membrane binding uh, uh, domain identification. Uh, so, um, in order to apply machine learning, first of all, uh, we need a data set. So our problem here is to predict the membrane binding regions. So we need the data set. 
uh, this is a classification problem where peripheral membrane protein three-dimensional structure with experimentally known membrane penetrating residues are known. Uh, we need to extract physical chemical and biochemical features relevant to these membrane binding interactions and produce a supervised learning uh, machine learning algorithm, which we can train based on the features and then evaluate the predictive model based on independent uh, test set. So here we created a data set of uh, more, uh, proteins that are attaching on the cell membrane and especially specifically with which uh, amino acids they do this. We extracted features uh, based on uh, physical chemical and biochemical properties and these were one, uh, some of the most important features uh, that we found uh, because the success of machine learning depends on their features and the capability to separate the two classes. So penetrating from non-penetrating uh, in the membrane. Uh, and then our data set consists of 54 peripheral membrane proteins with experimentally non-penetrating residues, which we split in two classes, penetrating and non-penetrating. Uh, of course, the penetrating uh, cases that we had are much less because it's not a very well-studied problem in the literature. So we needed to, we, we actually uh, did a, a balance uh, between the classes. Uh, and then we chose, uh, of course, the classifiers. In order to do that, uh, we don't know a priori. So what we do, what we did was to use a combination of uh, classifiers as, as, I, as I will show you. Uh, and also uh, to uh, fit uh, with different hyperparameters. Uh, so that we train thousands of models with different parameter combinations and finally keep parameters of the model with the best performance. So what we did is we trained the 21 uh, classifiers, uh, most of them from scikit-learn, uh, and we used the five-fold uh, cross-validation. So for a specific classifier and parameter combinations, we trained five times, each time with a different fold as a validation set, and in the end, we take the average of the five prediction score. So this way we avoid overtraining. Um, and then uh, uh, what we did for each classifier, uh, we trained thousands of models uh, with different parameters, combinations, and then we keep, kept the best model for each classifier that has the best predictive score with respect to predicting penetrating or uh, non-penetrating amino acids. And using a meta classifier, voting classifier, uh, we found our uh, end result. And our algorithm achieves 87% uh, score in classifying penetrating from non penetrating amino acids. Uh, so I think my time is almost over. Uh, so I will just go quickly to, the, to these results from uh, the predictions. Um, indeed, uh, this machine learning approach. Uh, is more efficient than other tools in the literature in correctly classifying the regions of the protein, unknown proteins, that will uh, connect to the cell membrane. And again, we have created a, a web server uh, for that purpose. Uh, unfortunately, my time is up, so I, don't, I cannot go into the computational modeling of oncogenic mutant proteins uh, using HPC resources. But uh, perhaps we can uh, organize another talk uh, to talk more in more detail about this. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. And uh, I am free to discuss, uh, open the floor for discussions. Um, thank you very much, Zoe. You, thanks very much for your interesting talk. You didn't have time to cover some stuff you said. Yes, you possibly. Absolutely. Uh, sort out another seminar next year or I don't know, a few months time. Sure. But there's questions. So if anyone has any questions to ask Zoe, then please raise your hands. Or uh, I have the chat here, I have the chat box as well. So you can also use the chat. Um, okay, Zoe, hi. Um, thanks very much for this very nice presentation. Um, maybe you said it, but I missed it probably. Uh, I'm not an expert in these biological systems, um, but you showed at the beginning of your talk that you have um, complex energy barriers. Mm -hmm. So the landscape of the energy, it's very complex. 
Indeed. So um, what are the algorithms that ensure that you um, sample the whole space yeah. of, of this landscape and you don't, uh, you don't end up in one uh, of the local minima or one of the minima or, I mean, what is the algorithms that uh, yeah. ensure this? Th th thank you very much for bringing up this question because actually this was in, in the part of the talk that I didn't have time to mention. So you give me the opportunity to, to speak a little further on that. Um, so indeed, uh, when we're using this algorithm, we have the problem of being stuck in one minimum, uh, either on the ground state or uh, wherever we are based on our crystal structure. So the problem is how can we overcome these uh, states and sample the full energy landscape? So for this, we actually use uh, enhanced sampling simulations. I briefly mentioned it for the nanoparticle uh, system where we use the umbrella sampling uh, calculations to overcome uh, the different barriers that we have. But another approach is the metadynamics uh, calculation, enhanced sampling simulation, uh, where you can essentially define a collective variable of something that you want to see, a, a transition that you want to see happening. So unfortunately, you cannot sample everything, but if you know you're interested in a phenomenon, and has a complex energy landscape and you cannot cross the barriers. Uh, what you can do is that you can actually start filling in the system with a Gaussian, um, here, I can show it schematically here. You can fill in uh, the system, the barriers with Gaussian uh, functions. And because you know what kind of functions uh, you have imported, uh, you can overcome the barriers, and then you can deduct. Okay. Okay, so I was saying that uh, you can use the system, uh, the, the landscape, the unknown landscape, you can fill it with artificial potentials in order to increase the energy of the system. Then you can transition to the next minimum uh, and afterwards, because you know how much energy you artificially placed in the system, you can extract it and then you have the full, you can have uh, the full curve. And uh, here, for example, what you can do is then you can model uh, the complex energy landscape of a protein, for example, undergoing a conformational change and find the minima uh, of your landscape. Uh, here, for example, uh, we had a transition between uh, this closed form. And if you observe this blue region here, it is moved to here, which is another minimum. Uh, and that's one way that we can calculate uh, these complex transitions. Another way is with a Markov state modeling and adaptive sampling. Uh, where uh, you can use essentially this Markov states, uh, Markov state modeling, where you can build kinetic models of uh, your simulation using a technique called the uh, adaptive sampling. So these are just two approaches, but thanks for asking because you give me the opportunity to uh, discuss this problem. Yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, interesting in the adopted uh, uh, mark of um, simulations, mark of chain simulations. Yeah. What exactly do you do? Uh, so here in this uh, workflow, what we do is that we can explore these undersample regions of the conformational space. So essentially, we uh, simulate the system, and as the system is being simulated, we uh, take um, uh, less probable states called epochs, and we start new simulations. So we start, uh, we use a starting points in each epochs simulations based on the most undersampled regions of the conformational space that we detect through these simulations. And then we run in parallel hundreds of simulations that have uh, uh, different starting points of undersampled regions. That yeah. helps us to cover as much as uh, possible of the conformational space. And then we use the Markov state models to discretize then 
the whole space that we have covered into a set of metastable states. Yeah, okay, but you have to let thermalize all these initial uh, Markov chains, right? You have to? To, to thermalize them. I mean, if you start uh, randomly, this multiple Markov chain, you have to let them thermalize before you do anything. So this- Yes, of course. I mean, you have to equilibrate the systems. So yes. these are not, uh, they, these are not uh, short simulations. Yes. The simulations yes. need supercomputers or so much, uh, even, even better uh, GPUs. Yeah, so how much resources, can you tell us, uh, can you give, mm -hmm. give us an estimate of the computational complexity here? Uh, absolutely. So for, for uh, the metadynamic simulations that I discussed, we used for the simulation that I showed you 16,000 cores on the Curie su supercomputer. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, we, we run different replicas of the system to populate uh, the energy space. Uh, and in, in this uh, particular workflow, uh, the adaptive sampling workflow, uh, because it is much newer, we are utilizing uh, Volta 100 GPUs, which very expensive, but very fast. Uh, so we can run a calculation. If we have a cluster of uh, Volta 100, maybe with a continuous run of one month in about uh, 10, 15 cards, we can cover efficiently uh, the space. For example, 1,000 trajectories, 50, second, 50 nanoseconds each. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. But the, the Volta 100, they are uh, very hard to find. I don't know if Castor C has a partition with that. No. Yes, we do. <laughs> so I will, I will apply. You will receive my application. Um, Professor Harmandaris, your question, please. OK, yes, thanks, Tejas. Thank you very much Ray, for this very, very exciting and very pedagogical also presentation. So, so naturally, I have many questions, but I would like just to, uh, so, uh, to, to follow up, let's say, a question from Dinas about the free energy. So yes. one of the methods that you have used are practically the core screen models mm -hmm. in order to overcome them. So, but you have used a rather more qualitative, I would say, model, like the Martini one, which is not yes. the bottom up in the bottom-up approach that you followed, for example, when you go from the ab initio to the atomistic simulation. Indeed. So I'm just wondering, so did you check whether the, let's say, more accurate force fields that reproduce the actual structure of the system are important in order to describe the interaction of the nanoparticle with the, with the cell surface? So that's why before, I did it, it was not very clear when I said it, but when we use the Martini model, exactly as you mentioned because it's a qualitative model and we were scared to jump into the nanoparticle system initially we constructed the phase diagram uh, of a system the dpp cholesterol uh, where we had experimental results and we directly compared the phase transitions of the membranes uh, and we found very good agreement and because of this good agreement, we were, we were later on not afraid to go into the nanoparticle system. And that's the, the reason we used it. But you are right. Nowadays, there are more accurate coarse grain models uh, that uh, we could use. But I'm just wondering more yeah. about the interaction of the nanoparticle with the DPCC, not the DPCC with the cholesterol, but right. more the interaction of the nanoparticle. So the interaction of the nanoparticle, again, as mentioned uh, here, for example, where we used the nanoparticle nanoparticle interactions at the same time interacting with a membrane. And we found these chains of nanoparticles, which we initially, it didn't make sense to us. We rationalized it through a combination of this ordered pho phobic effect. So the order disordered interface minimized uh, during the tetramer formation together with the uh, snorkeling effect. And then there was an experimental verification, which after the publication, from uh, transmission electron microscopy. So uh, in this uh, case, I think this is a good proof that this qualitative model works very well. I should say, however, I didn't have time to show this, that 
This works very well on membranes. So Martini has been very well calibrated for membrane systems. When you try to use it for protein dimerization, mm -hmm. solution, for example, it doesn't work very well. And we have uh, just a study accepted uh, where we show this. So for membranes, I, I think after all that we did and compared, I think that it works quite well. But actually, you have also very detailed atomistic simulations. So you yourself, I mean, you could examine this, right? Uh, Since you have the atomistic also. Correct. With the current computing right. power, mm -hmm. we could go to atomistic if we want. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. it's very nice, all this, the wolf construction that you are doing. Yeah. Where we follow a very similar methodology for nanoparticles in polymers, and this worked very well. So it was, uh, I like it a lot. No, thanks. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I mean, I mean, this is also, you know, an area for collaboration uh, yeah. and because we need the computing power and we have the computing power now. So I think in the 2020, 2021, I think we could go for it. Absolutely. And if, if I may do one more question, of course, Especially the last part, which actually, of course, we didn't have a lot of time, let's say, to pass it. Mm -hmm. uh, how easy is, or is it straightforward to define the features in order uh, to determine what are the best uh, uh, when you apply this feature ex extraction in order to identify membrane binding regions? Right. For uh, the machine learning, because now, as you said, the machine learning methods, of course, they need a lot of data, yes. but also they need an accurate, as accurate estimation of the features. Right, so here the algorithm showed us which is uh, the most significant uh, features. So uh, what we did was to collect uh, all the membrane penetrating uh, amino acids and import them uh, into the algorithm and the algorithm would essentially give more weights to features that uh, it deemed more important uh, for this classification problem. Okay, so it so was not these eight here features for the amino acids no, that penetrate no, the membrane. Yeah, so no, this is just an example. In the end, there were, I think, 700 features. Yeah, that's what I would say, that I would expect that you need many, many more features. Of course, maybe I should, you're right, maybe I should just clarify it a little bit more. No, this is nice. Uh, yeah. And it works quite well, even if you have only 50 or how many proteins there? It works quite well. Of course, the, set, the data set is very limited. It's only 54 uh, memory proteins. And there is no way we can uh, increase this because this is all the experimental data that we had. And we're thinking now that maybe we should uh, think of different ways to approach this problem. Instead of having a classification problem, maybe to go uh, towards uh, how alpha fold uh, the Google uh, team. I don't know if you've heard of uh, the success yeah, that yeah, they've no, had. That be mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe different ways to assess uh, the peripheral membrane protein binding. Although, yes, we found that uh, we had 87% uh, in this F2 score mm -hmm. in the classification, which it's not perfect, but it worked uh, quite well in at least the unknowns that we tried in our test set. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Anayata, do you also have a question? Yes, uh, thank you very much. That was a, a fascinating um, talk. Um, before before you got to the nanoparticles, I was wondering whether whether uh, it would it would be possible for a, a phase transition to happen to be induced somehow for something to enter. Uh, the human cell, and then when when I saw uh, the nanoparticles, I, was, uh, I, uh, I got excited. Uh, my first thought was whether viruses can do that. Um, is is because of now with COVID, uh, we know they they have this protein on their spike and they at attach and enter the human cell. Are are, are these cholesterols? Um, part of this process? Is this a general feature that, that happens? Uh, so yes, so this person uh, here, Francesco Stellacci at FFL, he can actually study uh, how the viruses can be incorporated in the cells and uh, also what are the interactions of nanoparticles with the viruses. 
so yes, uh, there is a similar mechanism of how the virus, the viral proteins, can enter uh, the cell. I'm not sure if I understand the question. If you were asking that. Yes. Yes. If 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 um, yeah, if this is a mechanism used by viruses as well. Uh, of kind course, of moving, of the, the moving away. Do, and they don't have. Uh, I mean, every entity has its own. Uh, Physical chemical characteristics. Here, the nanoparticle, the specific nanoparticle, has these uh, very polar, the charged chains. Uh, the viral proteins, what they do is they dock onto our own proteins. The, in the particular case of COVID, the ACE protein. So they dock in the protein and then they are translocated uh, in the cell. So uh, there's a different mechanism, uh, but oh, it all depends on the structure of the entity that you are looking at. So here, uh, these particular nanoparticles, they have this particular shape, and that's how, why they rearrange in such a way. If you change uh, their uh, radii from 2.6 to uh, 5, you have a different mechanism based on the transmission uh, electron uh, uh, um, microscopy. So, it depends really on the different char structural characteristics. That's why we call these structure property relationships. So the uh, spike protein of the COVID virus, it has some particular shape, which can dock onto the ACE protein of human cells and be translocated in the cell. These nanoparticles have other characteristics that help them translocate in the cells or not translocate in the end. Thanks. Uh, can I ask one more uh, course, question? Yeah, um, yeah I, I found quite exciting the formation of this nanopore, mm -hmm. um, this, this water pore. Um, I mean, what what happens next? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. With the formation That's a good of the water question pore? because uh, when I when I was presenting it in this conference where the experimentalist was there. Uh, he told us that he could actually measure the conductance of ions on this pore. And it's an experiment that we haven't done, but we would love to do it and see whether the rates of ion diffusion are comparable with experiments. But you can measure it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, They're all very, very nice questions. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Panayoda. Andrea, you're up. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello from me too. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is, I've seen in a slide that you've used the 631 G star basis <laughs> set for your quantum simulations, right? Uh, I wish. Back in the 2000s, we used 321 without G. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so this was a very, yeah. Okay. This one, you mean this one? Okay. Yes. Yeah. For this one, uh, yeah, we use DFT and 631G star. Uh, for the normal mode analysis, uh, we use 321G, okay, without the star. Uh, it was back in the 2000s and the computational power back then was very low. So this was really the best we could do. But let I will let you ask the question. Yeah, no, my question is basically, so uh, I wanted to just understand uh, if, so the point charges that you've calculated with DFT, have you fed them into the molecular dynamic simulations and then went back to correct them again and again as a, as a sort of iterative process? So with each time, with each structure, you've you've done, um, you've been refitting the the improved charges. Let's say. So no, this was done only for the vibrational modes of the system. For the charges, we calculated the quantum mechanical electrostatic potential. Uh, here around the molecule, mm -hmm. and then we found the set of point charges that best reproduces the electrostatic potential of quantum mechanics. And we did this only once. It's a least square fit uh, okay. procedure. It's very simple. We just mm -hmm. you just do it once. You find the set of point charges that reproduces the quantum mechanical electrostatic potential, and that's it. Okay, and. Um... Uh, okay, so basically, uh, 
I forgot what I wanted to look at to ask. Um, basically, I cannot form it now in my mind correctly. Uh, <laughs> okay. it, it, it has to, it has to do with um, let's say if if we if um, have, if we tried more complex uh, let's say uh, basis set or uh, different uh, potentials mm -hmm. to to match, would do, would you expect to get the same uh, fit? as a, a, a less complex one then? So is this the limit that we can reach? Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, no, every case is different. And actually uh, you have to look in, before doing this procedure, you have to look in the literature, what is the best procedure of molecules for molecules similar to yours. So mm -hmm. for example, we knew that for non-polar molecules such as cholesterol, if you use heart fog, in, instead of DFT, uh, yes. you get overpolarization in your charges. So mm -hmm. that's something you don't want. Uh, so you have to always look in the literature what others have done and what's the most appropriate method for your molecule or similar molecules, obviously, not your molecule because the charges don't exist, yeah. for similar molecules. So if you have polar molecules, if you have molecules that are solvated in water, um, or non-polar molecules, you have to take different th uh, theories. It always okay. depends on, on the molecule. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Dimitris? Hello, so from my side. Uh, dear Professor Cunha, thank you very much for your, for your insightful uh, talk and for the broad uh, topic that you have shown here for, from all your research from back 2007. Yes. I don't know. I don't know if we have to also. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if we have to also uh, just say some few words about my ourselves. Just introduce yes. introduce of you. Of course. Uh, 